can all agree together right here. My name is Kim. Welcome to uh, First United Methodist Church. Uh, my name is Kim. And because I am really bad with words, Sam had to write it verbatim. And I'm going to read it as best as I can with heart. Uh, we're glad that you are here. For those of you worshiping online, please say hello um, and communicate with each other and with us so that we know who you are. And um, we're going to have communion, so please have them ready for communion time. This morning, we have a guest preacher, Mark Carzo, and I hope you extend a warm welcome a little later in our service when we extend peace to one another. Sandy will be, will be back next Sunday. I have just a few things I'd like to share with you. We are gearing up for fall, and so I'd like to point out a new collaboration effort for our children with Holy Trinity Episcopal Church. It's in your bulletin inside. It's called Fame, Fun, Arts, Music, Education. This is open to kids between first and sixth grade on Sunday afternoons, and the kickoff ce celebration is next Sunday after church, 12 to 1.30. They're gonna have uh, free hot dogs and different things and you know all that good stuff. Also, we are gearing up for our annual Fall Fest and we need you to save the date, Sunday, October 22nd from 3 to 6 p.m. If you recall, it was a huge hit last year. This was a great way to show our community some love. It's fun, gives us a chance to connect with our neighbors. We have a chili cook-off. For those of you who lost last year, Make sure you sign up, get your you know recipe ready, and spice it up so you could win this year. Um, bounce houses, games, trunk or treat. This is a free event, and we uh, we expect between three to four hundred children and people to come. So we'll need your help to make it a success. Email Sandy or Amy. Raise your hand, Amy. There you go. If you have some ideas and ways to help. We are hosting a parent and student breakfast for our little Voyager preschool on Thursday, September 28th at 8 a.m. It is another great opportunity to show some love to the families who attend our school. We are looking for five to seven volunteers to cook and serve breakfast. And for those of you who are really good at mingling and making friends, please come. Sausage, bacon, pancakes. That's September 28th, so please reach out to Sandy if you're available to serve. Sandy's beginning our four-week four uh, study called Learning to Walk. It's in your bulletin. It's inside bulletin. Learning to Walk in the Dark. Information is in your bulletin, and you don't have to read it in advance to join the group. You'll meet uh, Wednesday night at 6 p.m. or 10 a.m. Thursday morning at the parlor, whichever day works best for you. Lastly, Choir Cantata rehearsal is starting this coming Wednesday. It's from 8 to 8.30. For those who can't make it for regular rehearsal, I highly encourage you to come 8 to 8.30 for Cantata rehearsal. Uh, that was not last. Lastly, we have some pairs. Free pairs for those who like to take some pairs. It's going to be at the back. June, is that right? Yes. yes. So for those who like pairs as you go out, take some pairs with you. Wherever you find yourself, here, at home, or online, invite, I invite you to prepare your heart and mind for the Holy Spirit as we begin worship with handbells. So if you would please uh, meditate with handbells playing and opening our worship.
us, just as we are, to live as truth tellers and gospel bringers into the world. God, we know you call us, instead we ask, you will abide in your holy Like Moses, standing before the burning bush, convinced of his unworthiness to lead your people out of bondage, we ask, who am I that you call me? Like Peter, who thought he got it right, only to realize that who Jesus Jesus is doesn't meet his expectations of who is a savior, should be we ask. Who am I that you call me? As we raise this question to God today, we open our hearts to receive God's answer. You, you are, are my children. You, you are my disciples. You are a people called to share the love of God for the transformation of the world. Amen.
piece fits up. I am so glad you guys just got here because I wanted to say, we are actually going to celebrate today and do some games and we're going to have a nacho bar and we're going to have a lot of fun because I am so, so proud of these kids. When I first came, it was a little rough, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> it was a little rough. And getting kids to sit and listen and listen to uh, the Bible stories that we were telling. But I just want you all to give them like a round of applause because I am just so grateful. They sit, they listen, they are into it. And it's like all I could pray for. So if everyone would just give them a big round of applause. As we come to our time of prayer, um, we pray for our leaders, we pray for our congregation. Is there any other prayer request that, that is from the people right now? Joanne Smith. We'll pray for Amy and, and Gilbert. Any others? Yes. Garrett Cody. Garrett Cody. Garrett Cody. Let's pray for the church. The church. Always for the church. Right? Any others? We had a, uh, we, we lived up the family of Rockwell King High School student who died this week. All right, let us pray. Loving God, friend of the neglected and the despised people, friend also to the cherished and honored ones, we offer to you our prayers for this world for which Christ gave his all. We pray for the overthrow of arrogant and cruel, and for, for, and for discontent in the souls of the greedy and the careless. We pray for the uplifting of the meek and merciful, and for the encouragement of the poor and the pure. We pray for the recovery of the bruised and the lost, and the peace of those who thirst for righteousness. We pray for the feeding of the hungry in body or spirit, and for the healing of those who are diseased in body or mind. We pray for the comfort of the suffering and the grieving, and for the befriending of the lonely, timid, or socially awkward people. We pray for the humbling of the church if it comes proud, and for courage whenever it is shunned or persecuted. We pray for the strong and the weak in this congregation and for the spiritual health of all other churches in the community. Father God, you are more eager to give than we are to receive. Deal firmly with your servants gathered here now that we get rid of everything that clutters our souls and make way for all the new blessings you have in store for us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. At this time, I invite our ushers to come forward this morning's offering. We remind every time we take an offering during worship service, whatever that is, it is not just a way of you know keeping the lights on or making sure we keep an institution running. This is a gift to of, of faith to all of us to say, yes, we want to be a part of what God is doing in this world. We want to be a part of sharing the gospel with each other, and we do that through our church. And so we are thankful for what we can give. And so God, we ask that you take these gifts of our tithes and offerings and bless them 
and you give them, bless them and multiply them so that we are part of your gospel making in this world. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. process of becoming a pastor and then uh, and then since then connections here in the Rockwall Heath area as well over the last couple of years and I know that um, I am grateful to her for the blessing of being invited to be here and also just for the friendship and the ministry that she has here in Heath and so as we begin with our time of, of scripture of message together uh, would you pray with me Not be all else. 
physical core of the body. Now, this, of course, is the terminology that we've developed over the last decade or so. We don't hardly refer to our abs anymore. It's all about the bigger picture of the core, what's going on in the core, the pelvis, the lower back, the hips, the abdomen. Even if you are not one of those physical fitness buffs that I, athletes that I mentioned before, anytime you speak maybe to a doctor or a physical therapist, a wellness physician will talk about the strength of the core and how important that is to our body. If you read on the Mayo Clinic website, it says this, that building the strength of the physical core leads to better balance and stability, whether on the playing field or in daily activities. Also, weak core muscles can also leave you susceptible to poor posture, lower back pain, and muscle injuries. Therefore, strengthening core muscles may also help improve instances of back pain and other kinds of dysfunction in the body. I want to be clear again, this is what I'm told. <laughs> I, I'm no fitness guru. I like, for my part, the best core building I do is that I, I like biking, at least when it's not like you're riding out on the surface of the sun. My wife does yoga on a regular basis. That's a great core building. Uh, kind of uh, exercise. Also, my son does Taekwondo on a regular basis. They do a lot of core building the kinds of things. Anytime you're uh, working on your balance and doing, especially Taekwondo, involves a lot of kicks. That's a lot of core kinds of exercise. Now, I bring this up today because it is typical of a pastor to take something physical and turn it into something spiritual, right? So here's what I'm going to say. Beyond the physical, who are we at our core? It's important to get this right. It is important to get this right because, or else we might have poor spiritual posture. You hear me? You have, might have some lower soul pain. You might get some identity injuries. You might strain a family muscle. You might bruise a funny, but I'm not taking this too far. Is it <laughs> one pond or too many? It felt a little bit too many. Because there are a lot of messages about who we are at our core. We get them all the time. We're bombarded by those messages throughout our lives. The one that's most prominent probably around us, that, that from the moment we leave our front door, or for that matter, turn on any piece of technology, is the advertisement or the commercial world. They're all over the place. And essentially the message from that is that I am a consumer who needs things. Not only am I a consumer who, a consumer who needs things, I don't even know how many things I need until they get a chance to tell me that I need them, right? There's a friend of mine who started out in consumer marketing. I don't know if it's anybody in advertising, I'm really sorry about this right now. Okay. But what I'm saying is it's not any kind of marketing that we're talking about, particularly though this kind of thing. We're uh, a marketing that is designed to build needs in us, to implant them in us, whether we thought we had them or not. And he was part of this as he was starting out of college and eventually switched over uh, to the technical world, started doing some computer design. And he said, Mark, <clears throat> I just had to change because after, after I came home at the end of the day, I still needed to have a soul. <laughs> yeah. So commercials, advertising. I am a consumer who needs things. Also, I can get a definition of my core from my job, from the work I do. And that's been instilled in me from the very beginning. I am what I do when it comes to my job, when it comes to my work. 
Now the thing is, this is partially good, right? I mean, there's nothing wrong with, first of all, having a sense of accomplishment when I do something that is well worth it. Um, <laughs> nothing wrong in the words of uh, Thomas the Tank Engine to be, um, to be a good little engine, right? <laughs> to be somebody who has something that you're good at, to be a productive member of society. It's problematic, however, when that becomes my core. Because when I am what I do, then the moment I try to take a day off, then I'm kind of lost. All of a sudden, for one, two, three days, I start floundering for my own identity. Then not to mention what happens if I'm somebody who's home from work, somebody who is retired, somebody who's injured and out of work, somebody who just can't find a job, or somebody who just plain hates their job. They do it because they have to make ends meet. Then when you ask, I am what I do, if that's my statement of who I am at the core, then who am I now in each of those situations? Another place that we might find our core is in a collection of expectations that are all around us constantly. In those expectations, we might get a definition of core as, I am what others need me to be, what others expect me to be. Oh. We we'll find this all over the place. I live it in my life constantly and have to push against it. I am, for instance, what my family of origin, what my schools, what my peers, what my jobs expect of me, what they require me to be. When those are all healthy, sometimes they have a way of affirming us and building us up when those different systems can make me think at least I'm a good version of what they expect me to be but I still am living into those expectations. I still am what others need me to be, even when they're good and when they're not. Oh, you know what that is. When those systems are not what you want them to be, they can tear us down, they can destroy us from the inside out when our expectations are not meeting theirs. There's also, of course, the status and the hierarchy kind of expectation. It's one that's been around for a long time. It's present in some places more than others. And it says, I am my place on the ladder, right? And how I got to that place on the ladder can vary depending on your family of origin, your upbringing, what it is, maybe because of where I happen to be born into or what I managed to claw and climb my way up over, sometimes through just having a superior set of genes, sometimes having the work ethic to get further and further on the ladder, sometimes through determination, sometimes through ruthless cunning. You remember when People started uh, using, this was of course over a century ago when social Darwinism first came into being as a, as a kind of philosophy, taking the idea of evolution but applying it to a culture instead and saying whoever is the survival of the fittest, whoever is the fittest can survive and if, if you're too weak to be knocked down then you didn't deserve to be higher up on the ladder anyway. I am where I am on the ladder. That could be my core definition. What about the church? How is the church answered that question? Who am I at my core? I'd love to say that we have given nothing but beautiful answers, but our answers have been many and varied, and some of them have not been good. There's a woman named, a uh, pastor named Barbara Brown Taylor. I understand from looking at you, um, some of the events you have going on, you have some small groups going on with a book by Barbara Brown Taylor that uh, from last week and going forward. She was known for a, a long time, not only as one of the consummate pastors uh, in our faith, but also uh, just really spectacular preacher. Anybody who got to hear her preach, but even when she would have her, her sermons in text form were just astoundingly insightful and meaningful that could transform people's lives. It led naturally to her writing many different books and perspectives on the Christian life and who we are, especially in difficult places. She told a story one time of, that was told to her many times before when she was baptized. And her parents had not been going to church very much, very regularly. They would show up upon occasion. Somebody from a congregation might recognize them upon occasion here and there. Mostly Easter Christmas kind of people. You hear what I'm saying? But when little Barbara was born, they thought, well, 
certainly we should have her baptized, right? That's what we do. That's how we care for our child. And so they brought her to the church for baptism that day, and, and Barbara's mother handed her precious Barbara off to the priest. The priest and pastor took this precious child of God in her arms, and as a way of introduction to the baptism, told everyone just how sinful and evil we all are at the beginning of our lives. Just how much we are enemies of God. And thanks be to God that we have the grace of baptism and the grace of other parts of our lives that we are saved from the fires of hell so that we can be welcomed in the arms of Christ. And after the baptism was over, and he handed Barbara back to her parents. And Barbara's mother was horrified. You see, she would say later that she wasn't proud of everything she'd done in her life. Her mom. She'd made plenty of mistakes. Things that she would say, then that she would say were sinful. But this was not one of them. Barbara was not one of those sinful mistakes. They didn't show up in a church again for a very long time. Now some people might say, well, her parents just weren't prepared to hear the truth. I mean, they just weren't prepared to hear what the truth of the gospel is, that we are sinful, that we are broken, that we do need the grace of Jesus Christ. In fact, the preacher did say that, right? Didn't he say this gift of baptism, this healing moment of the waters of baptism, this salvation through Jesus Christ? That's a good message, isn't it? I can't, however, blame them for thinking the way they did, for receiving it the way they did. Because some might say that's the truth, but also it's a question not just of who we are and what the grace of God is doing, but who are we at our core? Who are we at our core? There's the doctrine of original sin, that we had the Adam and Eve and the fall. There's a further doctrine of uh, total depravity. This kind of follows, just to get a little bit, you know, um, into the uh, church history way of thinking, of total depravity, which is a part of a Calvinist way of thinking, which is to say, not only are we, are we no good, but we are so beaten down by the fall, there is nothing good left in us, and there never will be. All we can ever hope for is forgiveness, but not transformation. But the thing is, we lean into those, even if we wouldn't say, I hold that belief of total depravity, we lean into it in so many different ways, just by the ways we talk, the way we enter into the Christian life. The way we share that gospel with other people. I mean, one way I lean into it and others around me too is that it matches so well the self-talk of clinical depression. Anybody out there who's a fan of antidepressants, don't raise your hand at that, that's your first one. Um, you know, you can wiggle, wiggle your left toe if, if you've been diagnosed with clinical depression before. Or if you know somebody who does, there'd be statistically, it'd be impossible to uh, throw a ball into this place and not hit somebody who is, has a family member who's experienced severe depression at one point or another. And the thing is, the, the self-talk of depression fits total depravity to a T. I am no good. I never will be any good. Anybody who thinks, oh, this is the beautiful part about it, anybody who thinks that I am good, I have fooled and doesn't really know the true me. It makes it real easy and fits very well with this way of thinking about who we are at our core. I had a youth intern once, I spent a long time in youth ministry and then college ministry after that, and an intern who was uh, sharing a devotional, and he had one of those, uh, you know, paper flip boards, just you know, write on something and flip over a piece of paper, and he had, um, the, he flipped over to begin the devotional, and had a summary, essentially, of what it is, and it had two lines on it, and it says, <clears throat> If this word is offensive to be used in this way, I, I apologize. But it really sounds better to get this right. He said, we suck, dot, 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 but God, dot, 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 in a, question, in a, in a cross right there, right? We suck, but God. That was the, the summary, and he was going from there. And uh, this was really powerful to him, to somebody who could see the sinfulness in himself and say, God, 
the whole story of the gospel, there's a, there's a, there are lots of places, if you look through scriptures, there are some beautiful stories, some great songs that say, but God is the turning point to where something beautiful happens, except that he started out with, we suck. And I said, maybe it's a, a we sucked, past tense, you know, but we got better. And no, that didn't make it much better either. Um, I had a time when I was in college, and I had this moment where I wasn't exactly prepared. You ever been talking to somebody, you realize they're not a Christian, and you think, oh my gosh, this is one of those moments, right? <laughs> but you didn't think it was going to come about like this. And she said, she was kind of mad at me for uh, some of the things I was saying. And she goes, what is it that you do believe? And I said, well, first of all, people are horrible. And she, she goes, I don't think that's true. And I thought about this much later. I'm like, we didn't get much farther in anything about my beliefs about the gospel. That was the beginning of the gospel for me. And I was like, what, what was in me that made me think that that would be a good place to start? <laughs> because we lean into it. We've learned that part. It's part of kind of our DNA to start in that place sometimes. Not necessarily everybody, but for us to kind of lean into that place, whether we, whether we realize to that or not. Now, others have the reverse problem, right? Others have the reverse problem. Well, I am fabulous, but that guy over there, he really needs some help. Yeah. But then we come to a possibility that we missed the core biblical truth of who we are at the core. Because all of this church talk about sinfulness and evil in our soul is highlighting passages of the Bible, but just how low we can go. But they're not the only ones that are there. Especially when we come to a psalmist like the one who wrote Psalm 8 for today. It starts out with poets wonder at creation. First of all, have you ever just had a really great stargazing moment? I and mean, it's harder, of course, we all know when there's light pollution around, but if you've been in a place either of your own or somebody else's or on vacation or something where you can actually get away and stare up at the sky, but take that moment in the course and then um, where it may be on purpose or just stunned you so much that you had a chance to maybe uh, when you were younger, <laughs> lie down in the grass or, or something and just look up. You feel like you can almost fall into the sky and the wonder of all the stars and the brilliance of it. And it's come, sometimes you might experience this existential problem that comes from this immensity of all creation. Like you could, what is going on here that I'm this person somehow glued to this rock in the midst of the beauty and wonder of creation. It makes you into a poet, even if you can't get the words on your lips. A poet that would sing something like, Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds that I hands have made. But then the poet goes on in the song and says, Okay, I'm looking at the wonder of creation. I'm considering the stars and the sky and the moon and everything that you have strung across there. But what am I? What are we, us human beings, that you are even mindful of us, that you even pay attention, much less that you care for us? And yet, and yet, remember that but God phrase, and yet, not only are you paying attention, not only do you care for us, but in the very essence of our creation, you have made us a little lower than God and crowned us with glory and honor. The way this translates, by the way, we feel more comfortable by it saying a little lower than God. It can translate also into a, a little lower than the gods. Some people uh, would translate it until uh, they say, even you may have read, a little lower than the angels. However you translate it, it means there's, we have this semi-divinity about us. That's the part of the creation that's going on there. You've made us so high up. It's us, these little specks, these ants on this rock that are, being, that are being held by this gravity that we really barely fathom in the midst of the immensity of your creation that you have made us a little lower than you are. You carry that a little farther to get a better understanding. We go from scripture to scripture, like to Genesis at the very beginning. When it says that God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. We are, in other words, the living 
breathing embodiment of God's good work. And we also have a family resemblance, a deep family resemblance to God. There's another psalmist, one of my favorite psalms in the whole book, for that matter, one of my favorite scriptures in the whole book, Psalm 139. And at one point the psalmist says, For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I, I love this image of God. There's so many different images of God. This one is the, um, for me, is uh, my grandmother in a rocking chair. <laughs> and you got the grandmother got in a rocking chair with her knitting needles. Sorry, I have to say knitting needles. She's from the South. And all the things that I couldn't understand, but the detail, even when she was, she could, of course, and anybody who's done um, knitting or crochet, uh, you can get some things, of course, that become automatic with a muscle memory that's happening if you're doing something that's consistent. But if you are, of course, adding different stitches, if you're uh, doing different designs, then you have to pay attention to create something amazing, to create something new. The image of you being knit together in your mother's womb. So intimate an exercise. And then goes on to say, I praise you. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. That I know very, very well. In other words, God made me. And God don't make trash. Who are we in our core? Well, one, if the scriptures are telling me the truth, and I like to think that they are, I'm a precious gift of God. We are precious gifts of God and bearers of God's loving attention. Two, that we are the image of God. The divine spark exists within our very souls at our core. And three, that we are wonderful, wonderful works of God's design. Yes, the story of the Bible, our story does involve sin and does involve brokenness that messes with the picture, but that's not our core. The Bible is, is over and over trying to get this clear. That's not our core. And when we think it is, that we get really turned around and messed up. And it changes everything about you and about me. It changes everything. Just like our physical core can affect so much parts of our bodies, if we don't get this right, it can affect everything about our spiritual reality, about our theology, about how we live and breathe in the world, <laughs> about how we share the gospel with other people that might start out, well, first of all, you're terrible. Or, first of all, you are precious and beloved and has the, has the attention of, of everything in the whole universe, of the mystery and the beauty of wonder of creation, you have one special, unique place. You are worthy of that attention and love. You are worthy of that attention and love that God has placed in you. You, with all your flaws, bear the mark of the image of God, the family resemblance, the divine spark within you. And you are not, you are not the worst of what you think you are. You are not the worst of what you think you are. You, in the craziness of this world, are the intimate work of God's hands. And God, don't make trash. Thanks be to God. Amen. After that sermon, I want to acknowledge that we are about to go through the Great Thanksgiving. The Great Thanksgiving does acknowledge our own sin. It does acknowledge our brokenness. I hope to God it also reminds us of who we are at our core and who God is in the midst of our strength. So when we enter into confession, we enter into confession not because our core is a broken, evil thing, because there is a lot of muck that sometimes gets covering over that sinfulness of us. 
And part of us confessing is asking God to clear that away so that the true creation of God in us becomes clear and bright again. I tell you now that Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly seek to li live in his likeness. Let us draw near with faith, make our humble confession, and prepare to receive this holy sacrament. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the need. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now hold this thought for just a moment. Even while that divine image was covered up, even when we participated in fracturing it and sometimes covering it so much that you can't even recognize that divine image, Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. And now I say to you, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right to give our thanks to It is right. And a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, and he gave thanks to you, and he broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. And again, he gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples. And he said, drink from this, all of you. See, this is my blood, my life of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is dying. Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is Lord of heaven. O God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, invite us to join in the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of the Amen. 
This time we invite those who are assisting with communion to come forward.
This gracious God and Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks for hosting this, your precious meal, for giving your life for us, that we would know true life in you. Amen. And now as we, sorry, <laughs> as we prepare to go from this place, I want to say thanks again for your hospitality and warm welcome of me as I came to be part of this. I look forward to the blessing to continue to hear from this church in the, in the uh, weeks and months to come. And now as we go from this place in this time of worship, I invite you to receive the Lord Jesus Christ and know that the peace of Jesus Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into these doors. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.